Welcome to the Healing Place podcast, a space filled with inspirational stories of hope, along with practical advice for your healing journey. Your host is Terry Welbrock, trauma warrior, writer, speaker, blogger, therapy dog handler, and founder of the Sammy's Bundles of Hope Project. As a survivor and a thriver, Terry's mission is to shine the light of hope into the world by interviewing insightful guests from across the globe. Please stay tuned at the end of today's interview as we honor our sponsors. The Healing Place podcast is a fiscally sponsored project of Fractured Atlas. Now, here's your host and trauma warrior, Terry Welbrock. Welcome everybody to the Healing Place podcast. I am your host, Terry Welbrock, and very much looking forward today to my conversation with Barbara Rubel. And I'm going to read, because this is just amazing, all of this um, that she is doing in the world. Speaker, trainer, author, consultant, thanatologist, and I hope I said that right. She, um, yeah, she has the Grief Work Center, Inc., and we're going to talk about her book, but I didn't say goodbye, Helping Families After a Suicide. And today, we, there's so much we could talk about, but we're really going to focus on the um, survivors of uh, death by suicide. So welcome. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. I really appreciate that you've invited me to speak as a suicide loss survivor in this world of pandemic when other survivors can't be with other survivors, I really appreciate the space that we are not alone, that you're giving us this opportunity to come together. So thank you. Yeah, beautiful. And I, I love it that you, you want to touch upon this during this difficult time in our, the whole world. This is, this is the whole world. <laughs> and um, we're in this together, yet many can feel isolated. We are isolated. We feel isolated because we are isolated. We are told, go home, stay home. Well, for those who suffer from depression, those who suffer from panic attacks, those who suffer from all kinds of mental illnesses and physical illnesses, we need to be around other people. And now many of us are all by ourselves. So what do we do when our hearts are broken after a suicide? And we can't go to our support group or we can't go to, uh, uh, there was an, uh, a huge conference for the American Association of Suicidology, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people will attend. And now those professionals can't even attend the conference. So we are very much alone. So the foundation of our time together, Terry, is that although we are alone, nothing is hopeless. We yeah. are not hopeless. There is so much hope in this hour together. We are going to learn what it's like to, to feel that aloneness, but we are alone together. We are not alone by ourselves. Yeah, that's an absolutely just beautiful and hope-filled way to look at it. And that's, that's my whole purpose with this podcast is to offer hope and healing to others along their journey. And um, so I'm so incredibly glad you are here with me today to talk about that. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So let's talk about um, question one. Please tell us a little bit about your own story. Oh, well, speaking about being alone, I was very much alone. I was in the hospital. I was in bed and I was by myself because I was pregnant with triplets. So oh. they were in utero. I had three little babies inside of me and I had to keep them healthy until my husband walked into the room and told me that my father just shot himself in his head. He oh. killed himself while I was about ready to give birth to three little boys. Oh, no. And I was very much alone. And because I was in the hospital, they, they were born three weeks later, which tried to keep them in utero. And they were, they were very healthy. Thank God. However, I was not allowed to attend my father's funeral. I was not allowed to go to the wake or be with my mom or my brother or my family and friends. I could not be with anyone socially when someone dies. You need that. You need yeah. the support. And I was alone. And that resonates in me today because I realize how we all feel alone. And they're all, everyone's in their own home or their own apartment. And they're, they're sequestering themselves. They are staying together, but still very much alone because they're not with their family, their friends. 
And that's what happened to me. I had these three healthy babies. And after they were born, people would come to my hospital room and say, oh, Barbara triplets. Oh, my goodness. How exciting. So sorry about your dad's suicide in the same breath. How do you handle that? How do you handle not being able to say goodbye? Yeah. How do you handle this sudden, violent, intentional death? You know, there are so many variables. It's not just traumatic grief. It is all those characteristics that describe my own personal grief. My, my father, it was intentional. It was um, unexpected. It was an unnatural death. It was sudden. And right before he's about to become grandpa for the first time. When my mom died mere, years later at the age of 91, she was on hospital at hospice and we had the opportunity to say goodbye. But with suicide, there's no anticipatory grief. There's no way of saying goodbye. I love you. Thank you for every, whatever you needed to say. You have no time to prepare. So it's very hard for suicide survivors like myself. But we live as a survivor with this death that changes our life. I'd like to share with you some um, suicide statistics that absolutely blow me out of the water. Sure. One person every 10 minutes kills themselves. That means during this call, how many people will be dying by their own hand? And I pray that they don't, that they reach out to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. That number is 1-800-723-TALK. That's 1-800-723-8255. There is hope. There is someone waiting to talk to you. So what we're speaking about can bring up so much despair in people. And I just want them to hold on to hope as they listen to a story that feels hopeless, that where you feel helpless, but you're not. Right. You're not. You get through it. As time goes on, you get through it with the help of others. One, this is really scary, one of every 61 Americans is a suicide survivor. So right now wow. in your podcast in the United States, I'm speaking to 5.4 million, 5.4 million suicide loss survivors just right here in our country. 290,000 suicide loss survivors a year. So at the end of this year, we'll have almost another 300,000. This is frightening, frightening stats yeah. because there's over 48,000 suicides annually in the United States. So talking about suicide postvention, which is all the things you do after a suicide, we are preventing suicide. We are talking about it. And that is the most important thing we can do today is talk about our grief, our loss, and share it. Share, like, especially our grief. Like, I'm a thanatologist, and you did pronounce it right. Oh, yay. I did. You did. <laughs> and people say, wow, you're a thanatologist? How cool. What is it? And I said, I'm a specialist in death, dying, and bereavement. They're like, oh, oh, right. hey, then, <laughs> right. bye. Right. Like, oh. But let's, let's just share a little bit about grief, okay? So people understand what is grief. And, and basically, after a suicide, it's shock. Absolute shock. How can this happen? How can she have done this? How can he have done that? How can they have done this? And there's self-blame. Why didn't we know? Why didn't we see the signs? We could have done something. We should have done something. We feel guilty. We also, this feeling of responsibility, it, it wears away at our heart. Our heart absolutely breaks. Someone once said it, I, I ran a suicide loss survivor support group at St. Francis Hospital in Trenton many years ago. I think it was 1994. And someone said when her son died, it was like having open heart surgery without anesthesia. That is just, uh, that really stayed with me. Yeah. So we feel helpless. We feel deserted, abandoned. My father abandoned me right before I'm about to give birth. How do you kill yourself right before your, your daughter, who you love, how do you do that? Right. The, the thing is, um, their minds are made up in that moment. They're not thinking of anything but their pain. They are in so much yeah. physical or, or, or mental anguish. They can't see through it. You know? And 
And I think that's what happened with my dad. And someone said, well, why didn't he wait until after the babies were born? Oh yeah, that would have been a better time. There's no good time to end no. your life. There is never a good time to end your life. Right. There's, there's shame and social stigma also when you're a suicide loss survivor. I would, because I'm a keynote speaker. So I'm on stage and someone actually during the break said to me, did you know your father was crazy? Like, how can you say that to a bereaved daughter after a suicide? No, my father was not crazy. Thank you very much. Another time when I was keynoting a mental health Congress, a, a person in attendance and a, she's a professional. She came onto the stage and into my mic, you know, told me what a great keynote it was. And then said, you do know your father's in hell. Oh, Oh my good. What do you do with that? How do you handle something like that? So there is stigma. There is this social stigma out there from, from everyone. It seems as a suicide loss survivor, but then every now and then, you get someone who truly understands, who shows up, who gives you the hug, who tells you how sorry they are. Yeah. I, I, I worked in hospice for many years too. And I was always surprised how the world embraced the grieving folk after someone dies from an anticipatory loss. But that's not often the same with suicide. People say, I don't know what to say. I'm not going to go. I don't know what to do. And, you know, just be there for the person. Just share yeah. how, how sad you are. It's, it's just so hard because you have to also understand that the statistics show, the studies show that there is an increased risk for suicidal behavior in survivors. So we have to look at that family pattern and be very mindful of being there for the person so they don't take their own life. Yeah. I would say out of all of the grief information out there that I've read in the journals, because I am a, a grief specialist, I think survivors search for a reason why. And we don't need an answer. I don't need you to tell me, well, your father had deteriorating discs in his back. He was in great physical agony. His suicide note said he could not live with the pain any longer. And that's why he's ending his life. And I don't need, I don't need you to try to de decipher that. I just need to know why. Why, Daddy? Why did you kill yourself? Why did you kill yourself right before being a grandpa? Why, why did you reach out to me? Why didn't you call me? Why? Why did you do this to mom? Why? And that's why I love suicide loss support groups. Because when you're sitting in a group, no one in that group is going to give you an answer. They're just going to give you the space to ask your question. And that's all we need. We need a space to, to explore our whys and to explore all the, the things that we can't talk about. Like I know one, another story stayed with me in my group, a mother, her daughter just died. She was 16 years old. And she said, I miss my daughter. I loved her, but I, I feel guilty about this relief. And I said, relief, what do you mean relief? And she said, I no longer have to shove pills down her throat. I no longer have to find the pills under her pillow and wonder if she's going to kill herself because she didn't take her medication. I no longer have to fearful when I, when I fall asleep that she's out with friends and that she's not dying by her own hand. Oh, that stayed with me too. So yeah. we have so many experiences and that's why our grief is so traumatic. It is so hard to understand, but podcasts, webinars, support groups, online support. We are not alone. Like online support, there are, when I, when my father died back in 1986, there was nothing online. I didn't even right. think we had an online, but today there's the Alliance of Hope for Suicide Loss Survivors. There's Save Suicide Awareness Voices of Education. There's Friends for Survival. Two huge organizations are the American Association of Suicidology and the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Now, these are only a few. What I'm going to supply your listeners is a list on, the, on your website of all the organizations dedicated to suicide prevention and a little bit about grief, maybe some books that they could um, order online. My book just came out, the third edition. I'm so excited. I'm excited. 
Yeah, thank you. It is. Um, it was 20 years in the making. The first book, but I didn't say goodbye, was uh, in 1999. The second one was in 2009. And this one is totally different. But I didn't say goodbye helping families after a suicide. It is chock full of information about how to support a family after a suicide. So if you are a clinician, it has all the information in part one, the research, the data, the information needed to provide support to your client or patient. And the second part is a story about a family in a suicide's aftermath and how to use this story to look deep into your own loss and use the, the questions in the back of each chapter to stop reading the story at the end of the chapter and apply what you've learned from the storyteller to your own personal loss. Yeah. So I'm excited about what I didn't yeah. say. And I love the fact when I, when I was looking on your website, one of the things that, that I had read was in this latest edition, how your character of Alex in the book now goes back and gives his, his survivor input 10 years after the fact. Yes, Terry. What happens at the end of each chapter, because he talks as an 11 year old child, and at the end of each chapter, he becomes a 21-year-old man and reflects back on what that experience was like for him at the time, how he went back to school or how he had triggers or how he, he talked to his younger sister who was five or an aunt who experienced gross, you know, post-traumatic growth, or like all the experiences that I, I melded all the survivors of suicide loss into one little child <laughs> and he became such a wise child. So what happened was I sent out my book to about 50 reviewers and I said, read this and tell me what you think of the character. And they said, He's the smartest 11-year-old we ever met. So I said, okay, I have to make him more childlike, but bring him back 10 years later as that man reflecting on the experience. Yeah. So that made the book into what it is today. It's, it's such a great book because if we have the opportunity to look back on our lives, we could see how we grew from the experience, how we found meaning in the experience, how we experienced personal growth or post-traumatic growth, who the people in our life helped us to find that meaning and how we, we became who we are today because of our story of loss. So at the end of each chapter, we see how not only he has grown, but how the whole family has grown. His aunt in the story becomes very active with suicide prevention, um, walks for the darkness walks, the suicide awareness walks. So she really gets involved. Um, the mother, you just see the idea of friendship and how close she became with one of her girlfriends who was there for her, who gave her a locket with her husband's name on it. Just little things that really showed us the significance of linking objects through the years. Like, do you have anything that belonged to your loved one that you now have who passed on? Yeah, but having having those things yeah. and, and going to a support group or not going to a support group, we are all so different in our loss. And this book shows us that we are not alone and that so many people say, I think I'm going crazy. You are not going crazy. Grief is a normal process. You are grieving and you're grieving in a traumatic way. It's complicated. It's not easy. And it's we, cyclical right? It's, it's yes. cyclical is that you come back around to the emotions. Absolutely. We have these upsurges of grief. You might be standing at the kitchen sink, just washing dishes. And then the next moment you're on the floor, hysterical crying because there was a trigger or you thought about maybe your mom who used to wash dishes that way. And mm -hmm. then you get up and you continue washing the dishes. Same thing with life. Uh, men have shared with me that they, are hysterical in the shower before they go to work, and then um, they get dressed and they have a good day. So we have our moments, we have our days, and triggers can sometimes make them much more difficult, but we get through them. We get through them as we find meaning in them. And I think it's so hard because we lost something so special. Right. 
for most of us. Sometimes we have a relationship that is dysfunctional and we don't want to be around that person, but then we think all the things we never said to that dysfunctional person in that dysfunctional relationship. There are so many nuances of this. We are all so unique in our grief, but again, we're not alone. And, and today, if you're a suicide law survivor listening in, go to the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention or the American Association of Suicidology and look up about their support groups. There are blogs for suicide survivors. There are articles that they can read, especially through Friends for Survival. There are so many things that you can do today with your computer becomes your best friend and fellow suicide law survivor that you're not alone. It's so important. Yeah. So well, especially we're recording this mid pandemic or mm. wherever we are in the, in, in this, um, what's going on in our world. So what we had talked about even before hitting record was the, the isolation part of it and people feeling very alone, but there are so many options now for for individuals to grieve and talk with others even while isolated that's right because we are very much disenfranchised in our grief you know our for suicide loss survivors our grief is not acknowledged it's not socially sanctioned publicly mourned supported it's really really hard and so we need to reach out to those who get it so we could talk about whatever it is we want to talk about. For some, it might be the fact that um, it was an ambiguous loss. That's really hard. That's boss's work. And I hear this a lot with survivors that when I ask them to share their story, they'll say, well, we didn't even know if my child was alive or dead because he called us and he said, I'm ending it. I'm at the hotel. I just want to let you know I love you. And the phone hangs up. So what hotel? Or that you find a note that says, you know, I'm, I, I'm, going into the woods, I'm done, I'm done. What, what woods, where are you? Are you alive? What do I do? So that makes it such an ambiguous loss. And also there's an issue of what's called psychological proximity. And I think that's so important because we'll say, oh, your mom died, your dad died, your sister, but it, it's not kinship as much as it is psychological proximity, which means my neighbor killed himself, let's say. I loved my neighbor. We would have coffee every morning for 25 years. And then you go to work and you're so sad. You're grieving the loss of just this neighbor. And you tell someone my neighbor died. Oh, you don't get the same kind of, of compassion that you do when there's kinship, mom, dad, son, whatever. And so that psychological proximity, we need to respect whatever the relationship is. You know, someone told me they lived in a building in New York City, and this was many years ago, and they grew up in the man who, because I guess years ago, there were elevator operators, and he would operate the elevator, and she loved that man. He was so good to her. He, I mean, now he had to give her a lollipop as a little kid, and then when she became a teenager, he killed himself. He oh. died by suicide, and she said that loss impacted her more than any familial loss, any friendship loss because he was such, every single morning, he was there and he died. So we need to be very mindful of how they define the person's death, who that person was to them and how significant that was. Also, I see that you have a pet, pet loss. For me, oh my gosh, a, an animal dying yeah. breaks my heart. I cannot handle that. Now, I am a keynote speaker. I speak to social workers and therapists. I speak about suicide, homicide, car crash, death, pandemics, you name it. But I cannot speak to a group of veterinarians. They invited me to speak a few years back about pet loss and helping our patients who has to put down a dog or a cat. Oh no, I said, no, no, thank you. I can't <laughs> do it. No, and they're like, but, but you don't have to see the family. I said, but I'll have to do the research. I'll have to talk about it. I'll, I'll be I'll be a mess in my hotel room that night. So I think as professionals, we need to stay in our own lane and know what we can support. We can't. But I but pet loss that gets me. I can handle suicide and homicide, but oh, when my cat died after 18 years, my oh. heart was broken. Broken. Yeah. They they are our family, aren't they? Yes, for sure. I know. As mine drives me crazy in here. <laughs> yeah. And what's his name? 
Well, Max is the one who just left the room, but yeah, uh, okay. he's a little. Was he shy. bored? Did we bore him? I mean, <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> I think I'll try to do better next time. <laughs> he hears activity happening outside. Uh. There's other people moving around, and normally everyone else is not home, but with all <laughs> of this going on, uh, the whole family is home. So he wants to know what's happening out on the other side of the door. So yeah. <laughs> well, Terry, thank God for our pets because those people who are home alone, right. who don't have anyone, those pets are keeping them alive. Yeah. They really, they truly are. So you know, thank God for for our pets. Yeah. And I wanted to go back just for a second to something you had said early on to this. And it's so weird that my, I had a Facebook memory pop up from my personal Facebook page and I just shared it um, maybe two days ago, three days ago. And it was four years ago, I was going through EMDR therapy for my trauma history. And what it, what I said was that um, during EMDR that the suicidal ideation had popped up and my wording, the way I worded it just had a powerful impact on me when I read it here four years later. And it mm-hmm. said, do I want to die? God, no. Do I want the pain to stop? Hell yes. Mm-hmm. And so that was, I mean, what you were just talking about, it's, it, that's exactly right. It, no, I don't, didn't want to die. Mm-hmm. Not at all. And but yes, I wanted the pain to stop. And so I think it becomes so overwhelming for many. And so people who are listening, no, you don't want to die. If you want the pain to stop, my gosh, please know there are so many ways to help the pain stop. And there are people to help you. And there are resources. And there is hope. So that was my and- yeah and, and and I'm glad that you're saying the word pain because whether it's physical pain or mental pain it is pain uh, our society though disenfranchises those who have mental pain and I I believe that many professionals they are not trained in suicide prevention right. they don't know how to help you it is not in their curriculum in in social work they may have a class or two but um, maybe a touch upon suicide prevention, but we really know, need to know what are the theories about suicide prevention? What's CAMS? What, what, you know, what is, what's QPR? What, they don't even know what these things are. And it's, it's critical that we change that to save lives, to prevent children and elderly. I mean, I got a call a couple of weeks ago that a nine-year-old child killed herself. Oh my God. Yeah. Bullying. It was bullying. Like that is like, now they're calling it bully side. Like somebody, somebody said, is that bully side? I'm like, ah, listen, all these new words. I, I, I just am thinking about the family. I don't care about what you call it. I just care that this family is devastated. This child didn't have a way out. So if you're nine years old or 90 years old, don't, don't end your life. Right. Get online, call that 1-800-723-TALK, yes. speak to a family member. You know, family members need to take it seriously, no matter what the age. It's never okay to end your life, never. Right. Never. Yeah. Right. It leaves such a legacy for the entire family. You know, and, and let's go back to my book for a second. What did I call it? But I didn't say goodbye. So you could tell me, oh, your father was a police officer. He was a sergeant in the army. He was a loving father. He used to take you to Coney Island and buy you ice cream at Nathan's. And, but, but, he, but I didn't say goodbye. But I didn't say goodbye because he took his life in a sudden way. He ended that communication with me. And that's why today I, I have a true spiritual connection with my father. I believe he watches over me. I believe that he felt there was no other way but to end his life. And and I was recently on another webinar and someone said, um, you know, I hear that many suicide loss survivors are angry, that they, they just deal with the anger. Like that's the first thing that comes up. And for me, it was just sadness, overwhelming sadness that he would take his own life like he would do this to himself, to my mom, to, to our family, and to, to my children. Like they are now suicide loss survivors, even though they never met their grandpa, because it's a legacy within our family. And I find that out a lot too when I'm doing my groups and, and, and with those who I speak with, they'll say, 
my uncle, my, I found out my aunt, my, my both grandparents, like they didn't even know until they started talking about it, that there are so many other suicides in a family. It's really, really hard. And you know what's sad, Terry, the untimely death, like my father it was called an untimely death because he died right before being a grandpa to triplets. But the stories that resonate in me are, is the teenager who died right before graduating from high school, the girl who was buying her, well, the, the woman who was buying her, her wedding dress and right before the wedding, she killed herself. These untimely deaths, like right before a big event. And that's what resonates in me and my support group when people would say, I can't believe it was a suicide. He just joined the gym or he just put money down to go on a cruise. So I can't believe it was a suicide. Why would he do that? Or maybe in that moment, they knew they were going to end their lives and they were feeling really good because they knew they weren't going to be in that pain any longer. So we can't really make sense out of this senseless act. It's just so hard to understand. But by talking about it today, we are giving other hope that they're not alone. They're not going crazy. There are other survivors out there. And we can understand all these things we're talking about, the stigma, and our family issues, the disenfranchised grief. Oh, speaking of grief, I, I know one more thing I want to talk about. There are two different types of grief. Ken Doka calls them intuitive grievers and instrumental grievers. In our society, it is accepted to be an intuitive griever, to have intense feelings, to emote, to cry, to scream, to you know, throw yourself on the grave and everyone's mourning. That's an intuitive griever. That's who most Americans are. However, there are instrumental grievers. There's a lot of thinking. If this emotional expression is done in private, they're the doers. They're the ones who, like myself, I'm an instrumental griever. I wanted to set up a, a, a support group for other survivors. I wanted to write a book. I wanted to be on the radio. I was on the radio so much after my father died because I needed to talk about suicide to prevent suicide and all that. So whether you are an intuitive griever or instrumental griever, it's okay to grieve the way you grieve. But society doesn't like the instrumental griever. I don't think she's grieving. She hasn't cried. She hasn't shed a tear. No, that's healthy. It's okay. It's okay. We grieve in our own way. Just respect that. Be okay with that. Be okay with that. And yeah. that's why my book, but I didn't say goodbye. I have the instrumental grievers and the intuitive grievers. I have the issues with, with stigma and ambiguous loss and, and all the issues that come up in grief in one family's story. Because someone just said on another podcast I did last week, well, why did you make up a fictional story if you have the story? And I said, because each character is a suicide loss survivor I've met. And I've melded them all together into one family. That resonates in us because we're all a family. And especially now with this pandemic, we are closer than ever. We are further away from each other, but we are closer than ever. I'm also, my keynotes are on building resilience and job burnout and secondary traumatic stress and, and vicarious trauma. And I believe that we are burning out as professionals with all this trauma and there's so much secondary traumatic stress and we are becoming vicariously traumatized by the trauma in the world. So we really need to hold on to whatever it is we hold on to. You hold on to that dog. You got Max. Right. Some people, some people don't have Max. Yeah. So what do they have, they have, they have their faith. They have their knitting. Someone the other day was a call in program. And I said, well, how, how are you getting through this? And she said, I'm knitting, I'm knitting, I'm knitting in my sleep. I laugh so hard, but it doesn't matter if you're knitting or if you're praying or if you are petting your dog, do whatever it is you can do. However, yesterday's program, people called in and all they were doing were eating. <laughs> They they're eating. They're gained 20 pounds since the pandemic. They will not die from a pandemic. They will die from obesity. <laughs> it was the I would just put that post out on Facebook saying oh. that exact thing. Yes. <laughs> it's so funny because it was a call-in show. You know, call in, speak to Barbara. She'll help you with your job, burnout, your, your vicarious trauma, your stress. Barbara, how do I stop eating? I'm like, I'm <laughs> eating too. I can't help you. It was so funny. Well, yeah. 
That's basically yeah. it. <laughs> Just taking a moment to thank a sponsor to the Healing Place podcast, Fiscally Sponsored Project through Fractured Atlas, and for their generous donation this week at the Trauma Warrior level, the Phoenix Fund via Blue Mountain Community Foundation. Thank you. Now back to the show. Well, and you bring up such a valid point that I love in that, and I say this so often on the show, is that we are all on our own healing journey and that we need to honor one another's journeys, that there is no right way or wrong way to do things. There is no right way to grieve, that there is no right way to overcome trauma, and that we, we just have to honor each other. Some of us, like you said, will cry it out. Some of us will cry internally or in private that no one sees those tears because we need to carry ourselves as if we're okay out in the public world. And why? Because we're on our own journeys. Yes, we are on our own journeys. Yes. Absolutely. But we can experience also post-traumatic growth on that journey. That's uh, Bob Niemeyer's work. And some people who are less resilient after a trauma, they experience this, basically their world, their, their world has changed, but they survived it. They recognize their strength. They, they have new possibilities in life. They reevaluate their priorities. Uh, their, their core beliefs lead them to new opportunities. Like with my father's death, I facilitated a support group. I, I wrote a book. Um, yeah. Another domain of post-traumatic growth is better relationships. We may be closer to people. We have these higher emotional connections, or we may even accept help, where in the past we never would have went and got help. Um, there's greater personal strength, where we recognize that we're capable to deal with the future. If we could deal with suicide, if we could deal with pandemic, then we can deal with anything. Uh, there's spiritual development. They're open to religious questions. They might even have an intensified spiritual life. And that's what I'm hearing um, on the radio programs with this call-in. There's so many people who are becoming more spiritual, more centered. They're praying more, or they are uh, reading more about Zen or about mindfulness. Uh, you know, it, it's they're, they're, they have the time to do that. But I think the most important thing with post-traumatic growth is that there are new possibilities in life. You now have gratitude for life, that you are alive, that you didn't experience this pandemic personally, that you're healthy, your lungs are healthy. So what are you gonna do after this is over? Maybe you'll volunteer, maybe you'll go to a food bank, maybe, maybe, just keep it open for whatever you end that sentence with. Maybe I'll, and fill in the blank. And I think that's what's going to happen in life, that we now all have to fill in the blank. Now I'm going to, if I survive this, I will, and move into that positive place. That's, that's growth. That's, that's making meaning out of it. You know, meaning, there's meaning in loss where you tell your story, where you allowed me the gift today to share the story about my father's suicide to possibly prevent other suicide. That's my personal loss narrative. And I create that meaningful story of suicide and I incorporate that into the overall life story of who I am. I walk in that. I am a suicide loss survivor, but I'm also Alex's daughter. I'm also mom. I'm also a facilitator. I'm also a teacher. I'm also, we are so many things. You know, you're Max's mom. That's the most important thing. You know, it's who we are in life. But we can have negative meanings, like we can believe that the world is unsafe, We've lost our identity. Think about people who've lost their jobs this week. So yeah. many people are out of work. So if you've always said, you know, I'm a chef and you, you are proud of that. And now your restaurant is closed. Who are you? But we also can find positive meaning. We could say, I could say my, my dad is in heaven. Yes, he, he died by suicide, but he's in heaven. I could value life. I might have greater perspective for life. I'm right. going to live now. I'm going to live life to the fullest but also I have a survivor identity. I am a suicide loss survivor and I am not ashamed of that. I want to stand in that and let other people know that they're not alone. It, I think in the, in the end, we become more compassionate. And then if that can lead us to being more self-compassionate, I think we're all going to be okay. Yeah. Beautiful. I love it. 
And if you're hearing Max in the background, I'm very sorry. He's oh, don't be sorry. I think most people love the fact that you have a dog in the background. <laughs> we need that. It's human. You know, in my trainings and my, in my keynotes, I'll ask people in attendance, how many humans are in the room? And usually a quarter of the hands go up. So yeah. that's a problem with us. All we right. are all human. You know? Well, you know, it's funny what Max is doing right now is actually it really relates to what we're talking about because he's having a grief moment. The rest of the family just left the house. Oh. Um, my, my daughter had to go to a, to a doctor's appointment. And so, um, he is howling. <laughs> oh. I don't know if you can hear him, but he is, he throws his head back when people leave and oh. howls because he's having a grief moment. He's having a moment of my family just left and I don't know what to do about this. Well, I am a grief specialist and I will put into effect a support group for grieving dogs. <laughs> And we do not help anyone. It doesn't matter Dalmatian <laughs> or hot dog dog or what kind of dog do you have? We, I will make that happen. Right. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> well, I love, and you know, it, it is interesting to go back for one second because one of the notes that I had written to myself was that, and, and it just really struck a chord with me, was Alex's father's death. And I'm talking about the character in your book mm -hmm. is you had the words changed his life wounding him but also helping him grow and that's exactly what you were just talking about and i i love that the thought of being able obviously not death by suicide but being able as a survivor if this has happened that it, it is an opportunity to grow mm -hmm. and we can experience personal growth or post-traumatic growth depending upon your level of, of resilience uh, but we do grow from this experience. It does change us. It changes the fiber of our being. And we can come out of it doing something very special because of it. Look what you're doing. This podcast, the radio program, whatever it is that you're doing, you're reaching so many people because of your own hardship. So you grew from your own personal experience. And you tell people, you're not alone. You're going to get through this. Reach out for help. Reach out for help, but reach out to the right help. Make sure that that person is well-versed in your issue. So you needed EMDR. You got it, but you can't go to a counselor who doesn't know it right. and expect it. So you have to be your right up there up front with what you need. I'm, I'm suicidal. Do you work with suicidal clients? And sadly, a lot of therapists will not take on a new suicidal patient. Oh. Yeah, they're afraid of being sued. Well, they don't have the skill set. Right. It's very, very upsetting. Yeah. In, in one of my, my, my books um, for nurses, I have a whole chapter on, on suicide loss. It's, it's called Grief, Loss, and Bereavement, and it's sold through Western schools. I know they used to have it online where you can read a whole chapter for free, because if you're not a nurse, you're not going to spend $70 on a book. It's too expensive because it's a course book. But I think Western schools used to have the whole chapter, just go online and, and plug in my name, Barbara Rubel, comma, suicide, and see what comes up, because I have a lot of articles about finding meaning in loss. There's so much out there, especially now, we need yeah. to be able to find these resources online. So Which important. brings me to the fact, how do people get a hold of you? Well, they can contact me uh, directly on my website. It's griefworkcenter.com, G-R-I-E-F-W-O-R-K-C-E-N-T-E-R.com, but also my name, barbararubel.com, and that's spelled R-U-B-E-L. Uh, my email is barbararubel at barbararubel.com. Uh, my book's on Amazon, so go take a look. Um, but I didn't say goodbye, helping families after a suicide, uh, or just a uh, Plug in Barbara Rubell on, on the internet and read all the articles and things that I have out there to help you during this extremely difficult time. You're not alone. Yes. And that's, that's just the most important part of this is that you are not alone um, and that there is hope and healing opportunities. So, yeah. So anything else that you wanted to touch upon? I'm just taking a peek at time and seeing how we're doing. We still have, a few minutes left, anything you wanted to touch upon? I think if we had to touch upon anything with suicide, it would be that we need to recognize the psychological trauma involved because our loved ones took their own life. So yeah. we think about the pain that they were in, we think about the suffering, 
that they endured at the time of their death, what it took them to take their life, how hard that is. And that we need to work on moving from that space to a space where we can find hope, where we can find meaning. Because especially for parents after a suicide, they hold on to that moment. What was my child thinking, feeling? Why wasn't I there? It's too hard. And we need to work on moving from that place of despair because it is really hard to move to a place of meaning, to move to a place of hope, to move to a place of memories and sharing photographs and fun times and happy moments because there are a lot of those good times too. So instead of focusing on all the negative, let's focus on a lot of the positive. Yeah, beautiful. And because that's a moment, a moment of despair, but there's this whole life that was lived beyond that moment. That's right, a whole life. And in that whole life, God has given us the gift of memory and we can hold on to those memories. Our memories don't die with the person who dies by suicide. It is a gift from God that we can hold on to those beautiful memories. So instead of sharing the last moment of his ebbing breath, let's focus on all the good, funny, silly, stupid things that our loved ones did. Yeah, how beautiful, yeah. All right. Well, I just want to thank you for, one, the beautiful work that you're doing in the world uh, to shine that light of hope, and two, to, to just honor your story and to say, I, you know, I send you so much love and appreciation for taking your experience and helping others um, along their journey. So thank you. You are very welcome. And thank you on behalf of all suicide loss survivors who are listening to this. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Well, everyone, thank you for joining us today on the Healing Place podcast. And remember, until next time, be gentle with yourself. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening today to the Healing Place podcast with your host and trauma warrior, Terry Welbrock. If you enjoyed this episode, and want to learn more about Terry, her mission, and the Hope for Healing journey, visit Terry's website at www.terrywellbrock.com. Thank you for liking, commenting, sharing, and offering your reviews on our YouTube channel, audio outlets, and Facebook page. And as Terry reminds us, until next time, remember, be gentle with yourself.